I'm Patsy Miller, a volunteer with the Martin County Historical Society. We're happy today to be doing a, an oral history with Deborah Brown, a local girl, and Gloria Harrell from Great Britain. We're going to be interviewing them about their kinship. Thank you for coming to join us today. Hello, Joyce, Dork, shoot, Gloria. <laughs> Hi, David. We're so glad that you can be with us today for this story hour. We're uh, going to do a little talking about your past and your present. I understand that you're cousins. That's right, first cousins. First cousins. Mm -hmm. And you haven't always known each other. No. Uh, 2005. June um, 2005, we. That. So you live in Great Britain? I do, yes. And Deborah lives in Williamston, North Carolina. Good. Now, uh, how is it you became aware of one another? How did you learn about that you are indeed cousins? Well, I knew that I had an American father, and I understood that he'd actually been killed in the war, World War II. I was born in 1944. And I didn't understand why I didn't have any grandparents in America when I used to ask about it. So I gave up. I, my, I got the impression from my grandmother, uh, because my mother used to get very upset when I asked her about it, got the impression from my grandmother that you know, the family didn't actually want to know of the English wife and daughter. So I left it alone because I thought they don't want to know me, I don't want to know them. So um, never left you alone. That, that's right. So um, no, I didn't do anything at all about it until, and of course over the years you do think about where you came from, and my sons always used to ask about the, uh, the background, you know, our background. And so one day my husband said, look, I'll take you to America because we need to find out and I'm sure there's going to be a cousin somewhere who will uh, you know, talk to you, especially, even if it's just about the medical history. I'm sure we'll find a cousin who may be able to talk to you. So the first Excuse me, sorry, yes. Let me find out from Debbie a little bit about your interest in your, back, your family tree. Um, well, my mother is um, with Gloria Griffin. She's actually, Gloria is my mother's namesake. Mom had uh, nine living, there were nine living uh, children. There was one stillborn, but Granny and uh, Jim and Patty Griffin, they were farmers and uh, they lived on the prison camp road. That's where they had all of their children in the same, in the old home place. But uh, Mom grew up in Jamesville and uh, she married my father, who's from Williamston. But we had a lot, there was about 26 first cousins, including Gloria. But we didn't know about her. I mean, well, I knew about Uncle Willis serving in the D-Day, and then he was one, wounded at D-Day. His name and is my Uncle Willis. Her father. Her, his name is Will, J James, uh, James Willis Griffin. James Willis Griffin. Right. It's your your connection. Right. That's my mother. My mom was uh, nine years old when she was born, but she didn't know about him, of course. But Uncle Willis uh, was mom's next to the baby in the family and evidently a particular favorite of Uncle Willis. And uh, when he was overseas, we didn't know about this, we just knew that he was over there and he fought over there. And um, of course, uh, when Uncle Willis came back home, he did marry later, he had a daughter, Darlene, whom I met once, then he disappeared. Now, uh, Gloria, tell me that your at home experience in this right. well, I, I decided, the knowledge of the fame. And I decided I tried I joined ancestry.com uh, and I tried to find um, you know the Griffiths because I, I was the only Griffin that I ever knew of in England. It's not a common name over there so I thought it would be a piece of cake just to look down for Griffins in South Carolina. Because I thought it was actually South Carolina. And then I realised when I started to look on the uh, you know, Social Security Index, there were hundreds of thousands of Griffins. 
And so I d wrote then to the American Army and I asked if I could have my father's record because I knew you could do this. And so they, I filled in the form online and they said it would take approximately six months because of the 1973 fire in the St. Louis archives. But at the same time, I had actually put a message out on a message board on the Griffin Forum asking if they had any information about this James Lewis Griffin. And um, his last few weeks in, in uh, this country. And um, a, a, another a lady, a historian from the South, got in touch with me and said, because she'd asked for help on uh, locating, on information about two military hospitals. Well, my mother met my father in Tavistock, Devon, which is where they were practicing for the D-Day landings on Slapton Sands. And um, he was wounded in, and taken to Salisbury Hospital. And she was talking about the two places, Tavistock and Salisbury. And she had, uh, yeah, I, I, I saw her message as well. And so she said, look, I haven't had anybody reply. I said, could you give me any information? She said, no. But you give me your information about your father, and I'll try. I've got a contact in St. Louis and the archives. And the very next day, she gave, there was an email which came through. My husband shouted me down. I looked at opened the email, and it said, could this be your father, James Willis Griffin, and it bought birth. I hadn't told her the, the, his birthday, but it said died 29th of September 2000. And I knew it was my father because I had seen on one of the lists uh, that there was a James, a J.W. Griffin with my father's birthday in Indianapolis, who died 29th of September 2000. And I'd said, oh, look at that. There's a man there with the same birthday and the same initials as my father. Tell me about the, uh, in your home environment and how they reacted to your ancestry along the Griffin line. My, my, my English family, do you mean? Well, of course, my, we all thought, you know, father died. Dead. Well, you can imagine, I don't think I will ever forget. The, it felt like a physical blow because, you know, you think for all those years that your father has actually been killed in the war, and then you find that he'd been living in the States, and uh, you know, I knew nothing about this. And my grandmother was dead, uh, my grandparents, both grandparents, and my mother, my mother died at the age of 63. So I had no one to ask about this, except my mother's younger sister. Well, everyone in the family, my, my husband, my one aunt that was alive burst into tears, and she's not a lady known to uh, weep easily. That's the first time I think ever I've ever known this. And she was so upset because she said, I really didn't know. She was a 15 year old girl. Uh, she was quite a few years ago. But she was so upset. But then, of course, it was the, well, you know, who, who are they? What, what's happened? We must find out more about. Tell me about the child. Sorry? The telegram you received. Yes, the telegram. Well, I, I had obviously thought that he was killed because, of course, in the war, and I guess it was the same here, um, whenever in my village several people we knew families had received a telegram telling them about the death, the killed in action, the, you know, their son or brother, whatever. And my grandmother, when I used to press her for information about my father, because my mother used to you cry when I asked. My grandmother said, well, you know, he, he was killed because he, he had the telegram. Uh, no, my grandmother said, well, your, your mother had the telegram. So I assumed that it was that because she said she opened the telegram and she turned, she looked at the telegram and she said, well, it's just the two of us now. And she threw the telegram into the fire. And so I took that as a child that my mother was just so upset, obviously, hearing that, you know, my father had been killed in action. Um, That's what you believed for many years. Yes, all those years. Yeah. And then, and what, what was the 
time frame would we talk about? Um, that would be, I guess, my, I would, when my grandmother was telling me this, she told it me several times, I think, probably 10 years old. Mm -hmm. After that, I think I just stopped asking. And I was um, almost 60 years old when, I think, I was all about almost my 60th birthday when, um, you know, I had to realise that my father, well, 50 years had gone by before I realised the truth of what had happened. Well, I don't know what had happened, but the fact that my father hadn't been killed in action and, in fact, was uh, living in the United States all that time. Oh, David, yeah, do you know anything about uh, his life during the time he was in the, after the war? Oh, I'm sorry, because I never met Uncle Ross until I was, until 1978. He disappeared for about 20, 25 years. No one knew what Your happened. Your mother's brother. My mother's brother. Uh, I think the last time that the family was actually all together, all nine brothers and sisters and granny and grandpa, was in the early 50s. It must have been just before mom and dad got married or shortly after in 52. And then about, I don't know, three or four years later, he disappeared. Um, no one knew where he was. They even used detectives to try to, check, to track him down. No one knew what happened to him. But uh, he obviously left his wife and his little seven-year-old daughter, Darlene, her half-sister. And uh, he they weren't acquainted. No one, sorry? No, we weren't acquainted. Weren't acquainted. Oh, no, no one was acquainted. We weren't acquainted with her, and she wasn't acquainted with uh, any of us until like, until 2005. Okay. Um, that's when we first heard about them. But um, he didn't show up until 77, 78. It was after Granny had died, and he came back. He moved down here for two or three years, and they moved back to Indianapolis and lived there until he died in 2000. But that was my first time that I had ever met him, and I'd heard all, all my life about from my mom and dad. They, my dad just adored Uncle Willis. He was a charmer. He was um, uh, definitely a ladies' man, but he was an able mechanic. He worked on huge trucks and was very, very well liked, you know. I think he was a song and dance man in the, in the army, drove a jeep for General Patton. And uh, so he was quite a, quite an interesting fellow. Yeah, 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 interesting. I did, well, I, by the time I met him, he was sick, rather sick. And um, that I was approximately what, what year? year long. Was that, you know what year maybe that might be? He, I think he came down in 77, and he must have moved back in the early, about by 80, 81, because um, Grandpa flew to Indianapolis, the only time he'd ever flown, he flew to Indianapolis to visit Uncle Willis and Aunt Pat in Indianapolis, and then Grandpa died in 82, so it had to be between 78, and, or 77 and 82. And did you come into the store about 2000? 2005. 2005. Yeah. How, how, was that, how did you get involved in the store, Gloria? Well, I, as I said, I was tr just simply trying to find out about this, um, the, a to try and try to locate a cousin, to find out even just about the medical history, because I had certain issues that people have from that time. You know, people would say, well, there's no one in, you know, there's no one on that side of the family. Yeah. Um, has this kind of arthritis and so on. And um, so I thought it would be useful for my, and my boys, my sons were growing up all, and they would kept asking, in particular the youngest one. I think the eldest one had got tired of asking just as I have. And um, so my husband said, you would do it and next, we'll, then we'll go to the States next year. Because it was a country, I, I we travelled widely, but I'd never ever come over here because I just felt, you know, just wasn't a place I was, you know, wanted. And um, so um, when I got this from this um, email from Iris, the historian who had the contact and said, and I realized when I got that email, I saw died 29th of September. I knew it was this man in Indianapolis, uh, in Indiana. And so I then um, sent, I looked on the, and I then sent to the um, 
fled to Indiana for his death certificate. Because I was also still thinking this was South Carolina, uh, where he was born. And I got the death certificate and found my, I got it within five days. FedEx was fantastic. And uh, of course, I, on there, I got my grandfather's name, James Thomas Griffin, and my grandmother, Patty Elizabeth Mizell. And I realized it was North Carolina. So I went on the census, but I really couldn't read the census very well. Uh, the, it must have been, could it have been the 19, I can't remember which census, census, but there were only seven, there weren't all the children on that one. Um, I can't remember now. And um, I, could, I could see that there was, there was one name which was very unusual, which looked like, as I went over it several times, Egger for Lee. And I, it was a girl, and I couldn't understand that. And then I tried to um, see if I could find Ernest, I could, knew Ernest Griffin, and I found that he was dead. He died in 1999. So I wasn't getting very far trying, because there were girls, I knew it was difficult to know what the girls' names were to be, because they weren't married at the time. So I, my husband said, just, just for interest, put in Patty Elizabeth Mizell and see if you get anything up. Um, and immediately there was a record that thing came up that said, uh, there's a, a family tree on Roots Web, which I understand was incorporated into Ancestry. Um, and they kept the record. So when it went on to, I went on to Roots Web and found these names typed out because my cousin Beverly in Culpepper had actually started to put the family tree on, hadn't finished it, so only found three or four um, of the names. But I, I found that the, her mother's name was actually a Zephyrly. And her Beverly, well, Beverly's mother, and the one that I had been looking at, which was looked like Egger for Lee, and I thought, well, a Zephyrly is a very unusual name. Very unusual. And I had a surname because the surname was Moore. So I thought, I will just put this in to see if I can get anybody a part of the telephone directory and put it in and it showed an Ezephali Moore of Ohio. So I thought, well, that must be the only one that, uh, you know, it's such an unusual name. And at that point, I was, you know, I wanted to ring and yet I, didn't dare because I thought, I, you know, it was that, what if they say, we really don't want anything to do with you. And so I, my friend who actually is a um, historian, she said, you're not going to ring then, I'm going to ring on your behalf because I know you will put the phone down, so I'm going to do it. And of course she, picked, she said, she's an Irish lady, very determined, and she rang ready to do battle with these griffins who didn't want to know me. And um, of course, got my aunt at that time was in, had gone into a nursing home with dementia, but of course it was her son's address. So she spoke to um, my aunt's daughter-in-law, and she said, well, my husband's at work. I don't think we have any connection with her family in England, because she said she was doing some research, thought there might be a connection. She said, but I'll give you his work number. So she rang my cousin, Morgan, who is Beverly's brother, uh, at work, and he said, she said, do you have any connection with an English family or doing research? She said, no, definitely not. So she said, well, did you have an uncle, Willis, and uh, James Willis? And he said, oh yes, Uncle Willis was in World War II. So he said, come on, what's all this about? So she said, well, it, the research is for um, Willis, Griffin's daughter, at which he said, what, can I speak to her? We don't know anything about this. So she ran me back and said, and, and of course I thought I hadn't got an Aunt Gloria that I was named after. I'd always been told, because on this incomplete family tree, there were only the four or five children, the first few. She said, and she ran back, she was so excited. You've got more aunts, you've got five living aunts over here, she said, and you have got an Aunt Gloria, and you have got an Aunt Judy, and you've got, you know, she started to tell and your cousin wants to speak to you. So, of course, I rang him then, and he said, 
what on earth? Why did you wait until now? <laughs> so I told him the story. He said, we didn't know anything about you. And, um, you know, Uncle Willis was, you know, a dark horse. <laughs> uh, one could say the black sheep of the family, I don't know, but uh, certainly, um, I don't think he was engaged in criminal activity, but he was obviously a dark horse. Um, but he, um, he then, uh, his sister, Beverly, ran me in the evening to speak to her. And she was, we were both in tears. Well, she told me as much as she could have, we were on the phone a long time, about the family history. And my cousin Morgan had said, well, you know, there's a family reunion in two weeks' time. And, um... At Beverly's house. At Deborah's house. He said, yeah. we're going to have a re reunion down in Williamston. And Beverly, of course, told me this. And so she was telling me, so, um... We were, I was going to ring her later. And then, of course... Beth, perhaps Deborah could tell you because, of course, so Morgan and Beverly knew, but no one else did down here. Um, none of my aunts knew at that point. So I think Beverly actually ran Deborah then. Yes, and the world she had in touch with all those relatives for your reunion. Well, what happened was um, when Beverly called me, she said, We have a cousin in England. Of course, I've been an England follower since I was 10 years old, and I always went. Well, knowing Beverly was doing genealogy, I thought, oh, yeah, probably fifth or sixth cousin. cousin. And when I said, I said, oh, we do. She said, yes. She said, she's um, Uncle Willis's daughter. And I said, huh? And she said, yeah. She said, and she's named after your mother. And I went, what? And then we got cut off. Her phone died. So then I called Larry, her husband, at his house. He said, I already have her email for you, so you can email her yourself. And that's exactly what I did. And told her, you know, that I wanted her to come to the reunion, that we were having a reunion on June 11th, 2005. And um, so when when she went, I don't know, I think you were... Uh, just I was actually in holiday. Sweden. I, I was going to Sweden. I, I think I, we, David and I went to Sweden and left Nathaniel was at home. So in fact, Nathaniel, you know, I I contacted my um, when I was at work. At, I was a university lecturer, and uh, obviously June was not a good time for us to have any time off. But I spoke to my boss and said I just have to. She said, of course you do. So I was really, I was going to have four days to come to the states. You know, my colleagues were all standing in doing. They were delighted to stand in for me, and. Um, I, uh, so Nathaniel actually made the flight arrangements for me. I went off to holiday suite, so came back, and then got on the plane. was your youngest son. He is, my youngest son. And your son. older son is Richard. 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 Who's Jake? Jake is my grandson. He's, Richard has two children, Jake and Josh. And so, Josh. Yes, so uh, Richard is my eldest, and then Nathaniel is the second. Does Nathaniel have a family? No, no, uh, no, he hasn't, and he's actually. It's ironic all the connections. You know, one follows the connections through, and um, families are always surprised by them, but uh, they certainly exist. Uh, he's coming to live in Indiana for three years in January to come, and he's going to live in Indiana, uh, work in Indiana, because he's a mechanical engineer. Isn't that interesting? Oh my! And we have no idea that he. He, we didn't know about the father. He was work, He became a mechanical engineer. Became started to work for an American company, Cummins, and uh, <laughs> he's going up to Indiana of all the places to. Uh, and you met Nathaniel? Oh yes. Uh -huh. Nathaniel, the first time I met Nathaniel was when they came the following year in 2006, and we had at my house when Gloria came. I emailed everybody. Guess who's coming? We got a you know an English cousin coming. Well, we had about 40 or 50 people to come then that year, but the next year we had about 70 or more. And Nathaniel and, and David, her husband, and Nathaniel's uh, fiance, Stacy, came. So it was the first time that they had met an American family, and they were, needless to say, a bit overwhelmed with the talkative Griffins. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, there was one point Nathaniel turned. Uh, we were all talking, and he said, he turned to, my father was there, and he said, 
I can see where that my mum's a griffin. I know because she talks a lot. <laughs> and the rest of them do too. Did you find some health issues that were related to the griffin? Yes, well, like the, um, you know, the type of arthritis I have. Um, my, well, my grandmother had arthritis. My father walked with two sticks uh, um, in his 50s. And, uh, you know, my cousin that we. There's two of us, three of us, who've had operation on knees for and Aunt Judy, so there's, you know, the arthritis and particularly affecting knees and, uh, and a skin disorder, we definitely come, in fact, I've just said to my aunt, uh, well, that's a griffin. Uh, I've inherited a lot from the griffins. You know, musical. Play the griffins for this one. Play a mu a musical. Talk yes. Yeah. Love to eat. My <laughs> eldest son is very musical but, um, in the Lancashire schools, um, orchestra and um, it's a symphonic wind band and the school things. But he, um, my grandfather, my father and other members of the family are very musical and of course mm -hmm. Richard plays several instruments. So uh, yeah, I just talked to Roya when we were looking at pictures and because uh, when we first saw Roya I thought, she looks like an owl. No, she looks like Aunt Lady. But that's exactly. Then I said, No, she looks like Aunt Frank. And I told Mom the other day we were talking about uh, one of, another cousin said something about that when I when I described Gloria to them, she, she's got a little bit of all the ants in her. And I looked at Mom and I said, Mom, when I think about all of the cousins, Gloria looks more like the Griffin sisters than all the cousins put together. <laughs> she looks. She looks very much like Anne Ola and Aunt Frank and all. Oh, so to me, she's very much a Griffin, more so. So than she's I your am. first. Aunt, I mean, first cousin. First cousin. Gloria is your first cousin. No, sorry, Gloria is my your aunt. aunt. Is okay. Deborah's mother. That's what oh, my, my father, my my aunt. It turned out I was called Gloria Valerie Griffin because that was my aunt's name. Except the registrar in England insisted on Valeria because the English were very, you can't have certain, you couldn't then, you couldn't call your child unusual names, they have to be approved names. And so he insisted on me being written down as Gloria Valerie Griffin, uh, uh, Valeria Griffin. But I was actually Valerie, and I thought, I, until I uh, needed my birth certificate, I always wrote Gloria Valerie, V A L R W. -E. But then apparently my aunt's name is Gloria Verry Griffin. And I was, I said, oh, my grandmother must have got it wrong. And she said, no, it's my brother. Because in 1977, 78, when he came down, we were talking about names. And he said, well, and of course, you're Gloria, they were talking about their second names. Well, you're Gloria Valerie. But she said, I'm not. He said, yes, you are. She said, I ought to know my own name. It's Murray. <laughs> so she said, it's not your grandmother that got it wrong. Because, you know, my father's away in the war. My grandmother was going to register. <laughs> Maybe we still did. And um, it was, um, she said, it was my brother that got it wrong. <laughs> so I'm not quite Gloria <laughs> Valerie. I uh, over a young Gloria Valerie, yeah, I suppose. Is that a family name too? Valerie? No, it, no. Your mother, but I think her two older sisters, one named after Gloria Swanson and the other one after Marie Teasdale, who was a dancer. So um, I'm, you know, Gloria, Gloria, Gloria Swanson and. Uh, I mean, Valerie, is that a family name? No, no, it was just an accident. Because that's what my father thought his sister was called. Right. But it was actually Vuri and not Valerie, but he called me Valerie. Right. Yes. That was the intent to give your family name. Yes, but he wanted to call me after his sister. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, what's your educational background, Gloria? My educational background? I um, well, went to high school and then actually became a nurse and then um, went to college and became a nurse teacher and um, studied, you know, higher degree masters. And I, I became um, a nurse teacher lecturer. The, the health service used to have colleges of nursing and I was, mm -hmm. and I used to be the assistant director of the North Yorkshire College. And Alex Eppley was a nurse. Yes, he was. <laughs> And Beverly is a mechanical engineer too. Uh, and um, my youngest son, my eldest son, did mechanical engineering in the Royal Navy. 
And um, so I, I, I became a you know lecturer, nurse teacher lecturer, and then ran, uh, as I say, became assistant director of the um, North Yorkshire College of uh, Nursing. And then when the National Health Service put all their colleges into um, the universities, because we weren't at that time, uh, 19, I don't know when it was, 1990s, um, I worked for the University of York mm -hmm. and was assistant director running pre-registration programmes at you know, mm. the University of Yeah. What did your husband do? Um, well, he is a president. He's a business advisor for. Um, he was again in, from college. He used to be the um, head of the school of computing and information technology in um, Darlington College. But then he uh, became a business advisor for the regional development agency. They um, we have. Uh, People, business link, it's called advising businesses, people setting up small businesses. And he, he did that, but he also is involved in a European Union project, um, which is opening up all pathways around the North Sea. So he's involved with Holland, um, Norway, Sweden, mm -hmm. Denmark, the UK. Mm -hmm. So he's running that, doing part of that two days a week. Well, it sounds like you both stay very busy. Quite busy. But I've retired now. I retired last year, which is why I can come and spend seven weeks or so at a time. Well, David, how do you spend your days? I work at the uh, Winston Veterinary Hospital uh, five days a week. And um, most of the time I do the try to relax, read, and keep in touch with people that I love. You enjoy uh, veterinary surgery, I believe. Tell us. I'm sorry, you you're you're assisting oh, yeah, yeah. I love animals very much, so. Mm -hmm. And you assist with surgery? I used to. I have done so in the past. I don't do it as much as I did. But yes, I do assist with that. I have, um, I do other things to the inventory, helping with um, prescriptions and medications and things like that. What's the veterinarian's name? Um, well, Dr. Dr. Michelle Cox is the one who's our veterinarian, as well as Dr. Gordon Ramos. But Dr. Marlena Poppenberger is the one who owns the clinic. Yeah. You must be very busy if you've got three. Well, yes. actually, Dr. Marlena Poppenberger owns the clinic in Washington, the Pamela Animal, Animal Hospital, and she's there full time. But she, uh, so we just have these two. I see. Hello. Uh, can you think of anything you'd like to do while you're here, Gloria? You'll be going back soon. No, I, I've um, I've actually been to visit. I'm going back soon, so I've, I've been to visit another cousin, Deborah's sister, in California, and then Deborah and I went to Memphis for four days. And you um, already been in California? Yes, for six days. I went there to visit Sharon. So, and I'm actually the first member, apart from Deborah, of course, and uh, to first member of the family to have gone across to see Sharon, aren't I? Apart from yeah. the visits that you've made. So, so, uh, like. <laughs> so, so like. Oh, there yes, we go. So, we went there. so that was good. And um, and then I went to stay in Culpeper again with Beverly. And I'm coming back, obviously I come sometime next year, but we're going to, I'm going to the DAR Congress with Beverly next year in Washington. Okay. So, when is that? In the summer, I think, isn't it? Yes, June, the last week in June. Yes. Well, you, you've uh, really bonded with Beverly and Deborah then. Sorry, you've bonded very well. Oh, yes, yes. I mean, there's, I've got some wonderful cousins. And, yeah. um, so I have to say that... It's like a sisterhood. Yes, and I have to say that it was when I came and within hours of meeting them, it was as though we had known each other all our lives. And, and of course, um, my aunts, unfortunately, two aunts have died since I came into the family. And one aunt we went to see last week is in a nursing home and doesn't remember very much at the moment, I'm sorry to say. Um, and uh, But the two aunts, my, of course, Aunt Gloria and Aunt Judy, who lives in Rocky Mount, you know, I 
see as much of them as I can as well. Your nursing home aunt, did you know her prior to her dementia? Uh, I did, one? just the one visit when I first came, she yeah. was, and she was actually quite close to my father too, so she was able to talk to me about my father. Oh, yes. so and I did actually make contact with my father's widow, uh, no, uh, yes, I did make contact with the widow, but actually she was unfortunately suffering dementia, and um, I spoke to her daughter and son-in-law, who of course were absolutely astounded that my father had three children, because I discovered the thing we missed out was that I actually um, got a, a private investigation, because we couldn't find, my, knew my father had been married before, he had a child before um, he came to England, so I found my half-brother, oh, I saw this last week, and I found my sister. So it, in 2006, we actually met for the first time. Oh, and they didn't true. know of each other either. They didn't. No. <laughs> you can see, he's a dark horse. You're a real connector, I'll say that. It's been a real successful voyage. Yeah, it's been wonderful. And, uh, you know, I've got so many cousins and uh, aunts now. It's, it's great because I've got a very small family in the UK and here I've got a huge one. And David's okay with it. Absolutely delighted. He's, he's actually packing. He's been, we've had him a lot of jobs, haven't we, since he came? <laughs> Thank you so much with your being our guest for this interview, and we'll look forward to having you both back to visit with yeah, us. Thank you. Look forward to that.